Um, is John Picard going to join us? I don't know. He wasn't sure. So I think we'll just move forward okay. and stay on schedule. Thanks. Oh, I, I, I didn't even, I thought I saw John, but that might've been, I, okay. Okay, well, well, I guess we'll start off and uh, uh, we, we did it at a very good pace, I think, uh, Thursday. So let's hope we can do an early, uh, uh, finish this up early today. So uh, Chief Drum, you are up and I know stacy has been sharing her screen with the budget on it. Okay. And for people, it's uh, page 133 in your binders, if you have a binder, is the police department. Give me one sec. Chief. So is, is he going to share his screen? Stacy? Okay, I'm trying to share it. I don't have the one open with the um, page number, so I'm scrolling. I stopped sharing so I could scroll down and not okay. make people dizzy. So I'll be, <laughs> give me one okay. second. <laughs> okay. Okay, I got it. Yeah. Okay. okay. Can you folks hear me? Yep. Okay. Yep. Good morning, everybody. Um, morning. Morning, Chief. General discussion to start or any area in particular you'd like me to focus on? Um, the budget as presented to the town and your, the boards um, with the, the increases we see are all due to contractual or contracts. Um, they, as far as the actual, uh, what I refer to as the operational side, the cost of doing business, they, I kept them at zero flat. I also did not, uh, after discussion with the first select woman, with Peggy, um, decided not to fill the uh, open police position right now that we have the 31st, which would be for the SRO. Other than that, um, we're going to make do. We have no idea where our collection rates are going to be next year. And so um, I, I think we have to all somewhat hold a little bit. I, I will act say that um, the chief has been um, great in terms of, first of all, managing his budget. He's always an extremely good manager of his budget, but also getting a lot out of it. And I think we saw that this summer in particular with um, a lot of the you know uh, issues down at the beaches and everything else. Um, he's been able to really uh, just provide a high level of service, I think, to the community with, a, uh, with his budget. So um, we talked about the extra officer. I think that is definitely going to be something we need to put on the horizon. Um, but I, I, the chief felt he could still accommodate whatever needs we envision for the next 12 months um, with now adding that person this year. So, um, yeah. Any yeah, questions? Uh, yeah, uh, Chief uh, Phil Moore here. Um, Morning, sir. I'm, I'm looking, uh, how, how you doing, Jack? I'm good. I'm good. Thank you. Good. I'm just looking at the uh, personnel page um, and the, um, the the vacant police officer, that's the one that uh, Baxter had, you are going to fill that, is that correct? Well, that's the one I'm, um, that's the position I'm actually holding off on right now. Okay, you're, so, okay. So he is dropped down to, uh, um, to part-time, is, do I interpret that correctly? Yes, what I did was the officers that are retiring, I've, had a discussion with them and two of them agreed that when uh, we have another one retiring July 1st that they would remain part-time. You might recall it's one it's difficult to get good part-time officers and two if I'm able to use the part-time officers particularly with the summer imp uh, impact and the SROs back on the road I'm able to do business and uh, without putting too much of a strain on uh, additional strain on the services. So that that's where that he had retired he is working part-time for us right now um, as well as Jeff Tuho. Okay, and um, then also um, I noticed that the um, you got a couple of, uh, of part time um, in the executive assistant area or the clerical front office area, and this is uh, a couple of people who have taken a package and are left, but you've got them on there as being able to come in occasionally as needed. Is that 
correct interpretation? Yeah, the, in the case of um, the uh, Val Soul, who's our head clerk, she's retiring in July. Well, she took the incentive, but she is uh, done as of July 1st, uh, June 30th. And her hours have been reduced as per the uh, contract with the town. The second is Christy Hodge. Ms. Christy Hodge, who um, does, works anywhere from 10 to 20 hours part time. She does, she helps me out with some of the duties she used to do for me. And she also does the recording and the work for the police commission. We're right, we've this week advertised the position in house to replace her, then we'll go external. Um, I know it goes up to a, a, a the figure was unclear as to um, last week, but I think Deb sent out another uh, notice. I think it's somewhere, we'll say close to high 80s, uh, 90s, but that's not what the position is starting at. What I, I know that my chairman would like to maintain <clears throat> Ms. Hodge for the meetings um, that the police commission have in the minutes, and of course the notices. So that's probably gonna be like 10 hours uh, pay period. Um, so I'm trying to work that in, in conjunction with the executive assistant, whoever that may be, he or she that we hire, but it's not going to obviously exceed what the allotted amount is budgeted. Okay. And you're, um, uh, we've had a retirement in the uh, animal control area and the assistant moved up and you're advertising for the assistant now to uh, see that, right? Well, we're not, not as, not as of yet. We're trying to do is <clears throat> reduce any overtime for the ACO that might come up. Um, when we moved her up, we eliminated one position. Her hours increased. Obviously she was paid higher at a higher rate. Um, we're still in flux with where we're going with Clinton on regionalizing what we're doing there. We do regionalize with the animal control, but uh, we do have it at times uh, considered her covering some of the duties in the town of Clinton. Okay, good, thank you. And obviously compensation for that. All right. Peggy, can you expand a little bit on the contractual increases? Contractual increases, I believe, um, for uh, the police department, you're looking approximately um, just under uh, here under four percent, I believe, and that's a basically a three-year contract as a reopener. We and that was more of like a compression to get them uh, in line with uh, other departments of similar uh, calls for service and size and demands. So that's the first of that, of, uh, of the um, projected for the next three years. The others are the, the others are the unaffiliates or the UPSU contract, which basically is approximately two and a half percent. I believe my contract, I was just, I was just handed it and it was um, just, I believe it's around 3%. Chief John Picard, how are you? Hi, John. Hey, real quick, I want to go back to the officers and, and appreciate the job you're doing and the budget that you have. And I want to say, I don't know your contract as well as I should have, but does that affect not hiring the officer, your OT or your manpower clauses? And I also commend you, it's not easy to get police officers to work part-time. So just a question, um, will that come back at some point and cost us more in, in manpower and OT clauses? Well, the dis dis discussion I had with... with, with um, Peggy, uh, the answer is that there is going to be overtime, particularly, I, I have to assume that we're going to continue with COVID and the impacts through the summer. Uh, I think some people think that once they get a vaccine and just throw a light switch, that's not going to happen. Right. Um, I think we all could probably agree on that. So I'm probably going to have some of the impact of the summer because people want to get out and there's also there's ham and ass at our own beach roads and uh, our own facilities. So I'm probably going to mitigate it the same way I did this past summer. And I'm also going to see whatever we can we get refunded to us or paid for through the uh, <clears throat> FEMA and the COVID um, account. Yeah, just to follow up on that, Jack and I also had conversations. Um, again, I don't wanna add a position right now, if it's necessary, it's worked so far in terms of, you know, overtime and, and us doing the special appropriations. The concern that I had that I spoke to Jack about were the schools, the SROs, um, but it does appear that maintaining the way we've done things during this COVID time will also continue and be effective and not increasing right now, while we don't know some specifics about the future, uh, not increasing the base or the taxes for the public. Yeah, and I respect that. I, I just, and I agree with the job that the chief is doing. I know she had conversations with the first select and the baggy lines. I just wanted to bring that up. And at some point, if, 
it makes more sense, I think we revisit it. But I agree with the job the Chief's doing. Uh, so I just wanted to bring that up. No, and I think, yeah. John, you, you, that was definitely part of the discussions we've had about that, you know, because there's always an offset, right, with overtime versus hiring somebody on full time. And I think the chief and myself are going to be very mindful of that. Um, we're still kind of in an unusual year, I would say. Um, and so we don't want to make any long term commitments until we feel like we're kind of getting in a steady state. Um, so that that will very much be watched over the next uh, 12 months. Hey, I know you guys know. I think that's a narrative that needs to be repeated throughout this budget process, that any time we can avoid increasing the base of the budget during these uncertain times, I think that should be um, that should be our mantra moving forward until we have more definites. I think, I, think I, I agree to a certain extent, but sometimes you have to look at the whole picture. But uh, I'll, I'll John, I know you agree. Yep. Yeah. Now, John, I just, uh, this is, listen, maybe this is my former selectman hat where I used to live. Uh, we're not sure, we, we have no idea, or at least this is my impression, of where we're going to be with collection rates. And what I don't want to do, even though we still need the police officers, I don't want to lay anybody off because the town all of a sudden has, goes down, you know, as far as in the collection rates. So I, 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 pre I prefer to do it this way. And um, if we have to uh, put some overtime, we can do that. Generally, halfway through the year, I start putting the brakes on things. And if I have a project I had planned, I'll put it off to accomplish bringing the, the budget to zero. That's something I pride myself personally on. So um, I, I, I need the officers. I predicated on need, but um, I, I think it's prudent to hold off. And that's the discussion I have with Peggy. And I think we both concurred. And I agree with both chief, but that's why I said, I just wanted to bring that up. Uh, and I can go back on past experience. Sometimes you spend a lot more manpower and OT, which then did make sense, but you have a good hand on your department and I support what you're doing and, and what Peggy's doing. Thank you. Hey, Stacy. Thank you. <clears throat> um, I'm just, um, we, we've got a $200,000 increase in the budget for this department and I'm um, adding up the the changes and I'm having trouble coming up with $200,000. Am I missing something? Well, if you look at the wage line alone, that goes up 160. Are you taking the original column? Yeah. I mean, that's 160 right there. Oh, there it is. Yep. Yep. That's what I'm missing. Sorry. That's why I asked earlier about the. Yeah. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> yeah. <All right. laughs> For a lot of money, we're, we're not getting a lot of flexibility in reporting. <laughs> so, yeah. One thing to always remember with the um, when we look at labor is that we're still several officers do not take benefits, so that's always been a savings, which uh, through HR component, which really adds up, particularly over 10 years, certain. I and mean, we've exceeded a million dollars to savings based on that at approximately up to 200,000 a year. And what we provide for Anthem or Blue Care, whoever our carrier is at the time, minus the uh, incentive to uh, opt out of the program. And we've still been in the, over 100000 in savings. And this is, we're going on year 11 now doing this. So that kind of diminishes and brings down what our contractual obligations are. And it kind of uh, it softens the, uh, the increase effect on the, the town's budget. Excellent point, Chief. You know, he, uh, I think the Chief has done a great job of that balance of hiring retired uh, police officers versus trying to maintain, you know, um, people that are homegrown as well. Um, so that's kind of the strategy and it's been serving us well financially, certainly. So any other questions for Chief Drum? Oh, nope, no? he's doing a good job. <laughs> Thanks, Chief. Yeah. Don't let it go to your head, Jack. <laughs> no, I won't. I just wanted to uh, point out that um, on my car replacement schedule, I did take one of the cars and I put about $800 into it. Um, that was being replaced, and I transferred that over to the fire marshal's office. It has new tires, uh, I think a water pump, some belts. It was tuned up, so it's, it's great. It's safe for the road. So, so hopefully they'll get a, they'll be able to get um, maybe a year, year and a half out of it. Great. All right, I'm sure they're going to be happy for that. <laughs> Um, okay, um, now I know we have uh, Madison Ho, so we're ahead of schedule. Um, would, are they available, do you think? Uh, they're on. They're on, okay, good. All right, thank we you should, very much, We Jack. should probably warn everybody that we're gonna be ahead of schedule, yeah. so we can get out early. I sent an email. Okay. Thank you, nice. everybody. <laughs> yeah, you did, Lauren. <laughs> 
All right, great, thank you. Yeah, and thank you, Peggy, for sending around the coffee this morning. You didn't get the expense. We're supposed to tell anybody, Fillmore. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Chief Kittle, great. All right. Good morning. Good morning. How's that? I'm sure we, we all have our coffee now. <laughs> so, um, all right, great. Well, I guess um, looks pretty straightforward. If you want to just talk us through. Your budget. Sure. Yeah, I don't, sure. you've got the screen so you can see uh, Stacy's put it up here. Okay. Uh, for those who don't know me, my name is Bobby Kittle. I'm the fire chief downtown Madison, uh, currently in my ninth year serving chief for the department. Um, hopefully I'm pretty easy with you folks today. We're asking once again for a 0% increase. Um, we feel confident and comfortable with uh, the current number that we have to make through another budget fiscal year. So I, I don't know want me to explain everything like I do every year, but there is no change in what I need for operation. Um, we feel it suits us fine. The four officers sat down for a couple meetings. Uh, the captain ran through everything with us. And uh, once again, we're pretty confident and comfortable that we'll, uh, we'll make do for this coming season. Um, uh, Chief, a lot of the conversation you know, that we've been having through uh, this entire state of emergency has been on PPE. Correct. Um, and so are you just kind of keeping a status quo normal? Because all that I know has been covered through COVID relief and the town has been provided. But I just want to make sure you feel, you know, if this drags on for a while, you're going to nope, be fine. Absolutely. Uh, the current PPE that we have uh, with Russ managing it and everything over at the ambulance garage, for COVID related issues, you know, we did not add anything into our budget, our operating budget. Uh, we're letting everything go through emergency management with that, but um, we still have plenty of supplies down here, need be, uh, and we're pretty confident with what we have um, on site. So. <laughs> okay, great, great. Yeah, I figured it as much, but just wanted to make sure that you didn't feel that you needed to put some extra padding in here for that, so. Oh, we appreciate it. Thank you. Any um, yeah, I, I, I do. Maybe an observation. Um, the your budget request and the detail um, year over year that you give us don't don't they're not the same categories. Is there a, a way to get the budget request and then the way you're reporting your actual expenses to to line up? I don't know what you're telling me. Bruce. So you're asking for 165, right? Uh, Everlast. And you believe it's and, one. Right. And you're reporting that you spent 167 um, through your audit. Um, but those categories that add up. So I so clearly you're you know you're utilizing the money the town is is giving, but the breakouts are are different. And I was wondering if there's a way to line those up. So the breakdown is is for us basically within the department, but the captain estimates each line item is going to cost a couple hundred here, a couple hundred there through each line item. That is just a very detailed observation that we write down for you guys to see what approximately we spend for each category. So for example, the fuel bill, if we have 500 calls per year, it's gonna be different than having 600 calls a year. But that is the average number that we pay, you know, per month back to the town for our fuel bill. This, this basically shows our membership what each line item is estimated to cost. So this, that's projected and then the audit shows the actuals. Yes, no, I get that. I get that. They're just different, um, they're different headings. We've been doing it that way for, ever is there one that's bothering you bruce more than others i mean that the double no, click to it, me it, sort of helps i guess it it i mean it 
I think we're, we're seeing that, that the money they're asking for is in line with the money that they're spending as a department. I'm not challenging that. It's the, um, there's a detail that they give in their quest, and then there's a different detail they give in their, um, in their audit, and it would be just nice if they matched up. Sometimes it's the way the auditors categorize things too that might be different. Yeah, we could we could try to line it up yeah. for you for you, Bruce, if you'd like. I, I, well, I mean, the other way to do it is just to have the request come through in line with the audit. Well, I'd also say the, the other way, and, I, and now that you guys switched to Munis, it would be really nice. And Stace, I know you got a ton of things going on, but maybe next year or the following year, if you had year to date what they actually spent line item by, or previous year, so you get a little history and you get the year to date. Right now, we don't get that in the budget book instead of having to flip back to the audit just just a thought we don't have their detail john in munis we give them um either monthly or quarterly payments and they run the expenditures through the hose company so john i wouldn't be able to get that unless they okay. provided it to us fair enough i was also thinking about other departments too though the other departments, they're the actual column in the reports, that should tell you what we've spent to date. It should. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, all right, well, we'll see what we can do on that in terms of just making sure categories kind of align. Um, you know, Stacy can take a crack at that. Um, you can sit with Stacy one day, absolutely. Yeah. There's no problem with that at all. Okay. Um, Bobby, uh, uh, shifting gears a little bit, um, uh, would you save me some time of thumbing through a ton of pages and uh, tell me what your next uh, 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 truck replacement uh, is, uh, when that's scheduled and how that's looking in the capital? So I'm glad you asked. That was going to be the <laughs> topic I was, was going to speak with, if you would allow me to. Um, Currently, our rescue boat, our 2002 uh, Maritime Skiff, is up for replacement. And at the previous CIP meeting, mm -hmm. I stated uh, that the committee was still looking at all options. Um, and I knew we weren't going to meet the deadline to get onto the schedule for this season. And just this past week, uh, the boat committee finished up what they needed to do and gave me their paperwork to proceed. And I know I asked for the request to be pushed back one fiscal year for the boat. And I do have, again, the numbers with different um, prices to present and uh, see if you guys would like to handle that or go from there or however respectfully, you know, you'd like to go with it. I do have... I do have a small presentation of our boat and what the replacement is. If you guys would like to hear it, I have no problem uh, reading off my talking points. I, I, I think that would be uh, more appropriate for the CIP committee. Um, sure. and, and Jude, I, I can't, I don't know exactly where you are in your process right now, um, but maybe uh, looking at trying to get uh Chief Kittle to come back and, and, and do that. Cause I know you'd been talking about the boat recently. I'm um, not but, sure when we'd be able to do that. We took our last night and the letters being drafted um, for my review Monday because we have the public meeting on Tuesday. Okay. Um, so then I guess what the next step would be is, I guess, Board of Selectmen, right? If we wanted to make any amendments based on the new information. So, yes. okay. Um, we, we apologize for not having it sooner, but it was something that we felt we did not want to rush just to make a deadline. We wanted to make sure we had the right stuff to present to you instead of coming mm -hmm. off them. And I know deadlines are deadlines, but something that important, spending that kind of money, we wanted to make sure we had it right. So maybe what we'll do is, um, you know, the Board of Selectmen will then be going through the CIP recommendation at one of our workshops. I don't rem remember exactly when that's scheduled, but we could actually, you could send us that information for that discussion for the Board of Selectmen. Absolutely. I have all the paperwork with me. I'll put it in a box mm -hmm. and uh, I'll send it to your office for you. Does that make sense, Stacy? process-wise? Yeah, I just, 
<clears throat> you know, we talked a little bit with them and recommended that maybe it come up today since both boards are here to prevent them from having to go to the Board of Selectmen and the Board of Finance. But if you want to handle it that way, that's totally fine. <clears throat> I mean, I just think that's cleaner because process wise, it's now going to be in our hands since they've done their vote. So, um, okay. <clears throat> okay. The, Peggy, the, Peggy, the only thing I would say is I would not, you know, if it goes to the Board of Selectmen, it's possible then it would go to the Board of Finance. Right. It seems like a lot of meetings that we're going to add, possibly. It, it, Bobby, how long's the presentation? I can make it under three, four minutes. If you'd Peggy, like. would you mind if we did no, it? It's fine. I, it, it's fine. I get We're ahead saying. of schedule, I, so I guess okay. we can do it now. We are ahead yeah, of schedule. I get what you're saying. I just yeah. want to try to streamline meetings. We spent three or four minutes discussing, so Bobby, why don't you go? <laughs> I'll, 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 Thanks, John. I, Bobby, it's you can have the have screen if you, if you want to share, Bobby. I stopped sharing. Uh, okay. Um, I I'll just read it off if that's okay with you. <laughs> okay. All right, real quick. To give a quick overview, the boat part of the fire department was started back in the early 1990s. This is just a quick overview of what we do. Uh, there was a Sunday morning. There was a call that the police department received or a 911 call about a young boy drifting away in a rowboat. We did not have a boat. We did not have any type of marine response at that time. A few of the guys took their own boat they had posted at West Wharf and they went out and saved the kid that was drifting about a mile and a half away off West Wharf. At that time, it was determined we need a fire boat, which the department purchased one of our firefighters boats for $1. And we survived on that for a couple of years learning the ropes. In 2002, we received our maritime skiff, which is a 20 foot boat. It was designed as a recreational boat at the time, just the name of it, not because of why it's called a recreational boat, but that's just what it was called. Uh, the boat was purchased to fit on the rope system that's at West Wharf. It's operated in many successful uh, missions, but it's limited on retrieving victims from the water due to the high sides and no dive access. With the replacement boat we're seeking today, we have the new system down at West Wharf, which has the dock system now, which we can go a little bit bigger with our boat to make it easier for patient care when we do rescue operations. A brand new boat today, which this number is not what we're looking for, but we priced out everything just so we had it. A brand new boat that would fit our needs today would cost $339,608. The same style boat that we're looking at now, which is a used uh, boat, um, a used hull is what I should say, with new upgrades, we're asking for $138,742. So we would not ask for the sum to exceed $150,000 for a replaced new boat that is used with updated and newer equipment inside also, the trailer would not be used or new. We'd be asking for a used trailer since we only use it a couple times a year, which cuts the cost down of the trailer 50%. I know that's a lot to take in right now without the paperwork in front of you, but I, I have everything pointed out on a PowerPoint. That was a lot, I know. <laughs> uh, thanks, Bobby. I, I, for me, I think... I'd wait for my questions to decide if the BOS wants an in or out, and then we can talk about grants and other things. But for right now, I think I'll wait to see what happens with the BOS. So, sir, uh, with regards to the grants, we are always looking into the grants 24-7. Uh, so that's, that's an option we look at every, every time the new uh, season comes out. So we're always applying for that. Bobby, you're talking about year one or two. If it's year two, should we bump it to the 150-ish? If you mean, if it goes another year, you mean? Correct. Yeah. So yeah. first year it could be 138, but if it goes the next year, I'd recommend bumping it up 150 so we're not cut short. So what I did not say is with the 138,742, that is a haul that is available right now. Um, this, these are used Coast Guard type boats 
Um, we don't have a hold on this, but that is the approximate area of where that number would be. So if they sold this in the next couple months, another one would be available, but we just put it at 150 just in case, you know, the dealer sells it for another thousand or whatever the reason might be. But my boat captain recommended the one, the 150, but that was what that current one that they are looking at would cost. It, is it okay to wait for year two based on where we are? I'm okay with it. I, and I, I said that before, um, this is just something that they came back and presented to me and I felt comfortable uh, presenting it to you. I mean, it's in your hands how you handle it from there. Can I make it another year with the current boat we have? Absolutely. Okay. Um, it's just that the timing didn't line up for the deadline for me to have this. And that's why I asked for that to happen. And I just did. I didn't. Uh, Bobby, Bobby, just a quick question. I, I think you were saying it's it's actually going to be 150 if it was in year one because uh, on top of the hull you do need a few upgrades, uh, equipment, or is that right? Like, so the the 150 would include all the upgrades. Right, that's what I mean. But that's yeah. So Gene, yeah. if we were to escalate it, it's you know more than 150. But the the 150 is really the price there for this year. That is correct, sir. With all the with all the necessary upgrades, right? Thank you. Yep, the warning lights, basic rewiring, uh, paint jobs, skid stuff, trailer, radios, all that electronics. That would all. So, be but in San, hey, Stacy, um, Stacy, can you or Kristen, can you just clarify that because that's not yeah. my understanding. Yeah, so Bobby, the paperwork that we got, it looked like if we did put it in year one, the totals with everything, including the trailer, was 138. If we were pushing it out to year two, the thought was with escalation, we should increase it to the 150. Is that right? Yeah, yes. So the paperwork that I have in front of me, the, like I said, the quote that I have for the boat that they are looking at is the 138, 742. If we don't go through with it this budget season and that boat sells, the boat captain talked with the dealer. The 150 basically just gets us if you know a cost increase over the next 12, 13, 14 months. Okay. Um, I want to just point out too that this has been in the CIP, and and you know, the one thing the fire department does do uh, is it goes through the system correctly. They put it in. It's talked about, it's, you know, it generally stays within the process and we are able to save for it and prepare for it. So this is something that has actually been in the system, correct? Yes. Okay. Okay, uh, let me jump in here uh, and, and I'm, I'm looking at the uh, truck replacement schedule. Thank you for all that clarifying information, but- um, Terrifying. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, looking at the schedule, uh, whether it's year one or year two, we've got it in the capital plan for a hundred grand. So we're looking at um, increasing it either thirty-eight or fifty thousand uh, dollars as we get down the road. Um, and the reason I asked the question two hours ago, it sounds like, um, was uh, not so much about the boat, which uh, we've been hearing about. But the, uh, the next big replacement is, is the pumper out in uh, 24, 25 for 850,000. Um, and looking down at the bottom line, uh, after we do that, then the, um, the, the um, reserve fund would still have 128 in it. If we uh, take another 38 or so off of it or 50 off, we've got 80 or 90,000 left. So, the, um, the capital reserve account is adequate uh, to cover what we're looking at over the next uh, uh, four or five years. Um, and then an an another side question, I guess, for a chief is um, how is the pumper doing this 2005 pumper? Is it holding up okay? And um, uh, is it gonna give us a surprise a year or two early or in the bad side or might it, uh, is it holding up well enough to be pushed out a year or two? Uh, the truck is holding up very well. Uh, it is our most used uh, piece of equipment. It's our frontline piece. It goes to pretty much every single call. This Whether is your, I, your attack pumper, right? Yes, sir. 
Uh, besides that, the rescue is the second busiest truck that we have, but the pumper goes on basically every run that we do. Um, it's in good shape. It's running well. Uh, obviously, there are some minor issues with it, like all vehicles, but uh, those are the cycles we've had on these vehicles for replacement values, trade-ins, um, OSHA requirements, NFPA. I mean, we follow all the standards, and that's why our calendar, our calendar for replacement actually goes 30 years. So we plan 30 years out, and when we get into CIP, at the fifth year, we start getting prices um, of what area towns around us have gotten that are similar to what we'd be looking at, and that's how we sharpen the price. Uh, for example, I, this is kind of going back towards the boat, but I know there is an increase of what we're asking for um, than what we recommended for in the beginning with CIP. But also in the past, uh, our Zodiac that we currently have, we had budgeted for $70,000 and we paid under $20,000 for that vehicle or for that boat. And uh, for those of you who were here just a couple of years ago with our current ladder truck that we had, uh, we actually shaved $100,000 off of that price. So as I get closer to the date and getting what prices are currently out there with surrounding towns with the vehicles, that's how I really sharpen up the numbers. But the numbers that you see there, Fillmore, for the, the replacement are what the current going rates are for the similar vehicle that we'd be looking at to purchase that would suit the town of Madison. Okay. Thank you. Yes, sir. Okay, well, I think um, that gives a lot of information and, um, you know, we'll be able to uh, figure out how to make changes to CIP if the board wants to do that during our uh, Board of Selectmen workshops. Um, but I think this was helpful overview. Um, and I think just one more thing, Peggy, just to yeah. say, I, you know, the CIP, we're really trying to get that. It's a five-year plan, stay true to it. And I think, um, you know, this is an example of what's been in the plan. It's been, they've been following the plan. And I think that's an important part when we say, you know, do we move it in one year or two year? I think it's the idea as Fillmore pointed out, we're saving, we know where we are. We have the ability to infuse if necessary, if in a given year it's lower, um, the balance is lower than what we want long-term. So, you know, I just, I keep warning, you know, I, I guess not one's a bad word, but I just keep wanting to keep the integrity of the CIP as a five-year capital plan as much as we can. Okay, great. All right, well, thank you very much, Chief Kittle. Appreciate all the hard work you guys are doing. And, um, and you know, I look forward to, uh, you know, just reviewing the additional information you sent, but this is very helpful. And I know I've seen the boat in action and I know you guys use it a lot. I see the calls coming up all the time on my phone for water rescue. So it's, it's certainly an important, um, piece of equipment for you to be uh, responsive to emergencies for a shoreline town, so. <laughs> yes, just, to, just to give one last quick thing, uh, the committees that are designed for replacements on our, in our department, uh, they're not just firemen that, are, that designed this boat or came up with this number. I do have the boat captain who is a licensed uh, maritime captain. And then the two other committee members are retired Coast Guard veterans. So these are boat people within our fire department that have put this together. I mean, that's, that says a lot to me as a chief. I mean, mm -hmm. I trust them to go out and do what they need to do. And with their military experience and their time with their rescue division with the Coast Guard, that says a lot of where the price reflects in my mind. Yep. So, and Jean, thank you very much for speaking up for that. I appreciate it. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, so um, we are still ahead of the schedule. Thank you. <laughs> uh, so we're on to uh, uh, North Bob. Madison. Chris Bernier will be um, presenting for the North Madison Fire Department. Okay, great. What Morning. Page we, what page are we going to? 172. Thank you. All right. Good morning, Chris. Good morning. How's everyone doing? Well, good. Thanks. Considering we're here. 
<laughs> so, all right, great. So, you know, if you just want to give an overview real quickly sure. and talk about any significant changes or. Yep, um, well, absolutely. So, uh, so <laughs> thank you. Yep. So Chief Cohn is uh, working this morning in the hospital. So he asked me to present one of my other hats. I'm a deputy chief again for the North Madison uh, Fire Department, for those that don't know. And very similar to Madison Hose, uh, we also don't have any increases. Uh, we're a zero percent increase for this year, or for this next fiscal year, and we feel confident that the um, the funds that are there will be able to meet our mission uh, as appropriate. Um, we pretty much kept everything the same going through within our operating account and the hose and equipment account. So we've been able to manage those uh, quite well without any uh, major concerns especially with some of the newer radio and pager equipment that we've had. And then we also, some of our maintenance programs that we have, we just feel the funds are sufficient to, uh, to maintain those programs. Um, the only, I guess the only parts that we just discussed real quick uh, with the, the water tanks, um, we, you know, we're still working on those, those programs. I believe uh, Chief Cohen has sent a letter to you, Peggy, right? For the Suffolk and County uh, tank. Yeah, that was where, um, well, we can talk about offline because um, I, I just need to understand a little bit more who I'm going to those with those letters and, and kind of the history and what, because uh, I don't know what the his communication history has been. So, sure. but he did send me a draft letter. Okay, yeah, the Suffolk uh, and County Road area are, is the next spot yeah. uh, for the water tank program. And then uh, once that one is complete, then we you know, move forward in the program. Uh, in that section. And then as well with the apparatus replacement program, um, everything is moving along with that. We did finally uh, remove the old tanker so that a company did come and uh, take care of it. And our next apparatus replacement is our heavy rescue 1096, uh, which would be around fiscal year 25, 26. And that uh, apparatus is about uh, 21, 22 years old around that time period. So, but we have, uh, our preventive maintenance program is going really well. Uh, one of our lieutenants, Justin Capetta, is doing a great job with that, maintaining all apparatus and uh, getting on a great uh, preventative maintenance uh, program. Chris, I had a question about Nomad's audit. Do you have that? Because I don't think we've received it. I will follow up. Okay. Make sure that we get it to you guys. Thank you. Yep. Any questions for Chris? Pretty straightforward. No. Okay. All right. Well, that that was easy. Sure. <laughs> so, <laughs> all right. Well, thanks uh, also to you and your team. You guys are doing an amazing job, and we're very appreciative of all the service, especially this year. I know it's been busy. Um, so we're still we're we're grateful for all of that. Um, we appreciate the support, and similarly, we're we're still good on the personal protective equipment. You know, we maintain a good cache of supplies. Um, as Chief Kittle mentioned prior, you know, the ambulance is kind of the custodian of a lot of that equipment for the town, yeah, um, and the public safety. And we're uh, we have a good stockpile of that uh, of those supplies, uh, most of which has been provided by the state of Connecticut. Right, right. No, that that's something I know was uh, very different. You know, six months ago. Um, Absolutely, and it's, and it's it, we luckily have not had any supply issues, so that's been fantastic. Okay, I guess uh, uh, thank you very much. And our next is Madison Ambulance and Emergency Management. So, um, Lauren, do you think we're in a position? To, is do we have Sam and then I guess uh, Ed Wolf would be presenting for the ambulance, or? I believe for the ambulance, I should be myself presenting and Chris Dowler, our treasurer. Oh, yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> no worries. I'm not sure who else is, you know, on the call from okay. our, at least for the ambulance board of directors. Okay. Yeah, I don't see. Uh... I think Chris, I just Dowler, moved Chris Dowler over. Okay. Chris, what do you want me to share? Or do you just tell me when you want me to pull something up and I can share unless you plan on doing it, I can give you control. Sure. Um, I can go over some of my talking points and we can kind of, you know, go from, go from there, I guess. Um, and then I have some of those documents on my screen as well. The, the other ones that we sent that unfortunately didn't make it into the. Okay. Um, but if you want to just pull up, I guess, what's in the, uh, the additional requests section. Um, and while you're doing that, I'll just, um, Start off. So I think it's just Chris Dallarite. Was that the only other person from our organization? 
Okay. Um, what it looks like. Uh, hey, Chris, just before you before you sure. jump into the additional requests, I do have one question about your <clears throat> your budget um, under professional fees. You have about eighty thousand dollars in billing services, and I'm just wondering when the last time that was sent out for a competitive bid was. Um, for a competitive bid, we haven't probably done it in a couple of years. Uh, we do anecdotally look at some of the other um, organizations that do provide the billing service, but we actually haven't sent it out for a bid recently. Uh, the company we use is called Care Response. They're a local company in Killingworth, Connecticut. We've been with them since 2010 or so, uh, and they take approximately 9% of our, you know, collection, so to speak, or the, the revenue that comes in of the billable income. So that, and is that the, the standard way that, that these types of services work is that they just take a flat percentage of the, of the money they're able to collect? Yes. Yep. And is 9% sort of reasonable relative to the market? Yes. Yeah, it's something we could certainly take a, another look at and um, see if there's other, um, you know, if other companies are a little more, you know, competitive, but it's pretty standard from what we've seen across, across the board. We actually switched back in 2009 uh, from another company that we were not happy with the performance and we've been very happy with shared response and their responsiveness to our requests uh, and, and the work that they do. All right, thanks Chris. Sure, it's uh, billing is a very uh, you know tricky uh, uh, program with lots of changes that occur constantly with the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid and, and whatnot, but something we can certainly take a look at again. Um, but overall, um, if it's okay, I'll go ahead and, uh, and start. So again, my other hat, I wear the EMS director for Madison EMS. And then with also is Chris Daller, who's our treasurer and the board of directors. Um, you know, overall, um, we're very appreciative of the increase that we received last fiscal year that did allow us to um, raise some of our wages. You know, that's basically for us, our biggest challenge is always in personnel cost and, and wages and benefits has always been the, the trickiest piece for us. And so we were able to increase our pay and our benefits for last, or for the fiscal year that we're now, beginning July 1st. However, when we put those in place July 1st, we realized that we were still below kind of what we consider our market rates from um, the other area services. And so um, we, we put those in place. You know, we did some more advertising for positions and unfortunately we still weren't able to attract. Um, and unfortunately we also lost a couple more staff just because those those pay rates that we did bump them up to in July still weren't enough in comparison to other services. Um, and so after that process, uh, we didn't get any additional said full-time paramedic applications. Our board of directors decided to make an, uh, another adjustment later in the, in the year uh, to be effective November 30th. And after um, that process, once they made those changes effective November 30th, we found um, many more applications for full-time uh, employment. So we feel at least at this point, we uh, feel comfortable with the wages that we're offering and, and the benefits. Um, so that's probably, and that's really the biggest, uh, I don't know if you all had a chance to look at the supplemental documents that we sent over, but in terms of, um, you know, in terms of that area, uh, the wages are, are, are really our biggest increase. There are a number of, um, you know, assumptions or footnotes that we, we, we build in. Um, and some of those variables are especially around the health insurance. Um, we have a number of full-time staff uh, that work for other employers and uh, they take their health benefits from those organizations. So we budget for a little bit higher number in case we need to, you know, in case we have additional staff that do need our health insurance, but in the end, um, we only have a smaller group of employees. So there's kind of like some of those assumptions um, that we have. Um, I will say that, um, you know, we, I spent a lot of time with Chris um, and also Gene did as well, going through kind of the staffing model and the operational model for the ambulance. Um, and they actually took a reduction last year um, to kind of see how it would go, right? We asked you to kind of be a little bit more conservative in terms of, um, you know, pay scales and things like that with the understanding that it may not be successful. You might have to end up increasing rates and, and offering more uh, to attract and retain employees. So I think this is kind of an experience-based recommendation now. Is that a, a correct way to say it, Chris? Because you just realized we kind of tried last year to save some money and be cost efficient. And it just wasn't enough for you to get the staffing that you need and to and maintain um, appropriate you know, staff uh, to provide services. 
Absolutely. Yeah, no, that's, a, that's fair. We definitely worked really closely with, um, with yourself and Gene and Stacy, um, certainly over the last year and um, more certainly more recently with Justin's assistance and Bruce's guidance. Um, you know, it's, it's been just a little bit tricky to try and make sure we can still retain our existing staff and then recruit uh, to have new folks come in. So, um, th I mean, those are the, and overall, again, those are the main changes. Uh, so our audit is also, you guys don't have the audit, that's still ongoing. We've had constant conversations with our account and the auditors to see where they're at. Um, I did have a conversation with them yesterday and for the last fiscal year, so for fiscal year 1920, we're anticipating around a $30,000 loss uh, overall. Um, again, I don't have an exact number or the audit, but certainly once that's available, I will you know pass it on. And then for the fiscal year that we're in now, uh, because of uh, COVID, we're expecting around a $45,000 less in transport income, again, due to COVID. A lot of people are still uh, quite concerned and scared about going to the hospital by ambulance. They're concerned that they're gonna you know, contract COVID, so to speak, in the back of an ambulance or get it by going to the hospital. So overall, our call volume um, has been a little bit uh, lower. We're starting to see that increase now, um, but overall it's uh, been down from, from the last year due to COVID. So, so with that, if there's, I can take any questions that you have, or I'm also happy to walk through any of those additional documents that I sent out. I mean, the documents that I did are kind of the, you know, the usual ones that we supply that explain all of the, like how the billing process works and how the state rates. So those, those I have, I don't know if you have those, Stacy. Um, it's not in the budget book. That's the separate uh, document. So I'm happy to share my screen or whatever you guys would like to do. Uh, just one other thing, if you could touch on, um, you know, cause you've applied for funding from the CARES Act and, and then obviously there's some other stimulus uh, possibilities and state programs. So just maybe talk a little bit what you guys sure. are doing there. Absolutely. So we did um, apply for the CARES Act funding and we received funding. I believe it's on the round three distribution. We got about $3,000. So um, I think it was $3,047, somewhere in that, that ballpark. So there, to us, there wasn't any specific reason or why the dollars we got, but that was the uh, most recent amount that we had received. Um, we did put in for some other grant opportunities. Uh, we haven't heard back on those yet. We do always try to take advantage and we're, you know, I will say our community support um, from the General Madison community and, and those that support our organization has been phenomenal this past year. We, uh, we've been very, uh, people have been very generous even despite the economy uh, in supporting our organization. Our, our fund drive has done very well. Um, and we've also uh, take advantage of those other, um, you know, funding opportunities like the Essex uh, Community uh, Investment Program and, and some of the other foundation grants as well. So certainly we do seek out those grant opportunities what, you know, when they come available for us. Any other questions? Chris, I, uh, I asked this before, but just for the help or uh, benefit of us non-EMS experts, kind of like a day in the life. Can you just share for the group, uh, uh, you know, obviously the ambulance is open 24 hours a day. So on any eight hour shift or every eight hour shift, how many people are actually on the payroll during a shift? So during the shift uh, on a given day, there's uh, at least four people. So that's two, right? An EMT and a paramedic on each ambulance. And we staff two ambulances, 24 seven, 365. So that's actual road staff. And then myself as the EMS director. And then we have a deputy director, Russ Pearson as well. So. So, so you, that, yeah, you and, and, the, and Russ, I assume that you would be the, the, on your schedule here, the full-time management, the two people, but then every, everything else is, is actual operational. Staff. Yep, that's correct. And is your your schedule is your schedule and not that it well tw you're not twenty four seven I assume in your managerial role that that might be more of a <laughs> uh, more, more or less, maybe it but, is but. yeah no more more or less the phones are always on because there's just two of us so uh, even if my if I go away and I'm out of state I bring my iPad and my phones with me and um, you know we answer the phones and vice versa so in essence we're kind of always on we do cover each other but yeah no matter when somebody calls or really no matter where we are we're we're connected right you're you're available but not 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 at the station Correct. all the time. Correct. Yeah. Not, not physically at the station. Right. Thank you. Sure. Um, so again, if, if there's other questions, I'm happy to answer. And if there are, I'm also happy to walk through those other documents if you find it helpful or if you want to continue on with your schedule, whatever you feel. Let me, uh, uh, just a, a curiosity question, picking up on what, on your answer to Justin, 
So you have, um, uh, when a call comes in, the ambulance goes out with its driver and the uh, EMS uh, goes out in their uh, little follow car. Um, and correct me if I misspeak. And then you get to, uh, to, the, uh, to the patient. And if that patient needs to be transported, the, the EMS uh, jumps in the back of the ambulance and goes in uh, with the patient. Is that correct? Yeah, so uh, both crew members, the EMT and the paramedic, they respond together in the ambulance and then yeah. you know, whichever care is needed, if it um, needs advanced life support, then the paramedic would uh, transport that patient in the back of the ambulance to the hospital and the EMT would drive, or if it's a more of a basic life support, um, you know, not a, not a major a call, the EMT would uh, take care of the patient in the back and the paramedic would drive. Hey, Chris, I think Fillmore is talking about the fly car when we had that model. And that's oh, God. if you're yeah if you're talking about the support vehicle that smaller um, expedition vehicle if that's what you're referring to that is um, more used just for support purposes now or if for some reason um, we need to change the, the staffing uh, model because we're short for whatever reason due to personnel but yeah we don't that fly card doesn't respond like it once did if, if that's what you're uh, recalling yeah well, that was that was sort of uh, yeah yep. but but two people are always in the ambulance. Um, either the EMT or and, and paramedic or correct or yeah attending. okay yep all depending on the type of call you know certainly if it's a if it's a more resources intensive call like a respiratory arrest or a cardiac arrest you know that's going to take more crew members um, there's more people that are needed to manage the patient um, and also depending upon the type of uh, again the call some of our protocols dictate who is in the back of the ambulance providing the care so again for example a cardiac arrest we're by our protocol to so Yellow Haven Hospital, we're required to have two paramedics. One, one paramedic is managing the patient's airway to help with their breathing. And the other paramedic that's in the back of the ambulance is managing the medications and the other uh, care that's needed uh, on the way to the hospital. And then the EMT would drive. All right. So I just want to, for my own sake, in the book, the increase was 264. It's revised to 302. So in the past, you got 918,000. Your total ask now is 1.2 million, correct? Yeah, so, so some of those variables are just in terms of how we look at the health insurance piece and really- Yeah, yeah I just wanna make sure in my head yeah. I have the right numbers. Yep, yeah, you're correct. Okay. So there's some of those variables like we don't know where we're gonna be in terms of collections with, with billable yeah. calls. Those are the unknowns. Okay. Yes, you're correct. Okay, thank you. Yep. Okay, great. I think we're good. All right. Thank you, Chris. Well, thank you Thanks very much. to everybody. Appreciate it. Uh, for all your hard work. Um, and I guess uh, we can move on now in, uh, for the library. We're ahead of schedule, which is great. Um, uh, a full hour. <laughs> so is that going to work, uh, Lauren? Are the library people available? I just moved Nicole over. I um, had emailed Sunny as well, but I haven't heard back from her. So Nicole, I'm not sure if you're prepared to do the presentation or if we should try Sunny again. Um, no, but Sunny, I'm not prepared to do the presentation, yeah. but Sunny is um, aware. I've been texting with her, so okay. she's doing her best to, to hop on right now. So. so why don't we, can we take like a two minute break real quick? Because uh, I do have some children I got to make sure are alive downstairs. Absolutely. So hold on a second. <laughs> <laughs> okay. See it the way you should. Okay, yeah. how's that? Yeah, we're good. Works, okay. All right, good morning. <laughs> okay, so I have prepared a presentation um, that I hope is concise and helpful for everyone. Of course, as a librarian, uh, if you ask me a question, nine times out of 10, you're gonna get more information than you asked for. So, I will uh, present a lot of information. I will try to do so quickly so that there's plenty of time for you guys to ask any questions you have. So as well, a reminder- We had a schedule anyway, Sunny. So you got the yeah, full hour if you want Apparently, <laughs> <laughs> Apparently I can take everyone else's uh, leftover time. Nothing wrong with staying ahead of schedule, Scott. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. 
Okay, but uh, as a reminder, the library's mission is to provide access to information, foster lifelong educational and cultural learning, and cultivate relationships among our residents through the exchange of ideas. And this is for all Madison residents. So this year we are focusing on core services um, given the state of the world. And I am presenting the minimum budget required to provide adequate library services to all in our new larger library facility. So here is our budget request. This year it is for $1,499,351. We have doubled the size of the library, but we are only requesting a 19% increase in annual support. Since I presented last year's budget, we have moved into our new building. And while COVID changed the way uh, that reopening looked and what library services look like right now, we have been consistently providing over 40 hours of library services to the public each week since July 13th. Uh, what we have found in that six month time period is that our budget projections from last year were extremely accurate. The only significant change to our operating expenses this year is an increase in contributions to our pension fund. Um, as you know, since this affected municipal employees as well, a new actuary table um, now projects a longer lifespan for our employees. So that is unfortunately an unavoidable increase. In order to mitigate the impact of this increase, the library has made reductions in several areas uh, compared to last year's request, including a slight decrease in library materials, programming and part-time staff hours. Um, this will make it necessary for us to decrease our weekly open hours from what we proposed last year. Um, and that was our previous average from 2018 of 68 and a half hours per week. The proposed budget now uh, supports 54 and a half hours per week. Um, but the trade-off is that it will lessen the impact of the increase on Madison's taxpayers. The, um, now I should say in the slide, it shows that, um, so 126,400 of our increase is pension. The remaining 136,971 is due to the additional physical plant and staffing needs. So that increase directly uh, correlates with the needs of a larger building. Okay. In order to provide some historical context, our treasurer prepared this graph and I'm gonna explain it using his words um, so that I uh, don't mess up any of the technical parts. Okay, this shows that the proportion of the town budget allocated to the library has steadily declined during the past eight years from 7.28% in fiscal year 2013 to 5.37% in the current year. Our budget request for the next fiscal year is basically in line with the inflation adjusted approved allocation from 2013, even though we have a building twice the size and significant increases in pension costs, along with the normal price increase to operate any going concern. So essentially, the town's allocation to the library has remained relatively flat since 2013. And you, you can see there's a, a, little, a little bit of variation in the chart, um, but not a lot. Meanwhile, the library's expenses have continued to go up with inflation. And the result is that the library has had to continually cut expenses over the years uh, to the point that there's just nothing left to cut. So that has brought us to our current situation. This is the situation we find ourselves in now. Our fixed costs, including the pension allocations um, and contractual obligations, currently account for 24% of our proposed budget. Staffing expenses account for 66% and all other costs make up just 10% of our total expenses. And included in those other expenses um, is the cost of all library materials, books, audiobooks, movies, online databases, subscriptions for streaming, movies, etc. Um, that's the largest part of that other expense. That's 95,000 in the proposed budget. The very small amount remaining is library programming costs and business operating expenses, such as book processing fees, printing, postage, et cetera. So all this to say, uh, I hope it's clear there is no fluff in our proposed budget. 
If we do have to make a cut from our proposal, there is nowhere left to look except for materials and salaries and any cut in salary necessitates a cut in the open hours that we um, offer to the public. That would put us in the situation of having to decide, uh, do we cut hours during the day, which affects our senior citizens, our preschoolers, and all of our virtual and work from home residents who want to use the library, or do we cut those hours on evening and weekends when our services are vital to working adults, school age kids and teens, and uh, all the groups who are anxious to get in and start using our meeting rooms as soon as possible. So those are the decisions um, that a cut would necessitate. My last slide shows a comparison to the other libraries in our peer group as determined by the Connecticut State Library. As you recall from last year, this uh, peer group is based on population size and wealth ranking. Guilford is not actually included in this group. Uh, it is the one that I have cherry picked because the reality is we are always compared to Guilford. So I just preemptively put that information in the chart. This year, I decided to add more points of comparison for you because I wanted to show that we are presenting a budget that focuses on maintaining core services. This comparison chart is meant to give you some context so that you don't have to just take my word for it. As you can see here, our proposal for the coming year still has us well below the amount received by our peer libraries and their towns. Therefore, we'll be providing slightly less when it comes to hours, books on the shelf, and library programming. And um, you know, you can take a quick look, but I will provide all these slides to you after the fact so that you can take a closer look and go over the details later if you're interested. So with people eager to get back to their normal lives, groups looking forward to transitioning from virtual back to in-person meetings and more people than ever working from home, we believe the services we provide will be more needed than ever. This budget request will allow us to retain our current staff and hire the custodial help that is critical to being able to fully reopen and get back to near normal operations. Just like any business, the library wants to be fully open and we're ready to be fully open. But COVID-19 has meant that there are unfortunately additional costs to doing so. We certainly saw that this year when we reopened to the public but had to restrict our bathrooms, seating areas and meeting rooms because we simply couldn't afford the additional cleaning costs required to meet the governor sector guidelines for these areas. We can change all of that with this proposed budget and get this building fully open and available to all Madison residents. In conclusion, I just want to reiterate that our current request represents the minimum amount needed to provide the town with adequate library services. And I want to be very clear here that the customer service that you receive at the library will be excellent, outstanding bar none, that will not change. Um, I am just speaking in terms of hours, books and programming. For this year, those will be adequate. And I hope that we'll all work together in the coming years to work our way up to excellence in every category. And while we have questions and answers, I thought you could take a look at this beautiful picture I took last night on my way out. This shows the number of books currently awaiting pickup in our contactless pickup room. I'm happy to say, um, even with everything going on this year, we are averaging uh, just under 4,000 books checked out per month. How does that compare to historical, Sunny? Is that Historically, higher or lower? It's, like, it's lower than average. So in a, in a normal year, we would top out at around 10,000 per month. So our top, uh, our top during COVID is about half of what we do in uh, normal times. And I expect that um, it will be probably about a third of what we do when we fully reopen. Um, we are seeing a record number of new library card holders every month. Um, our historical average for in pre-COVID times was creating about 25 new library cards per month. And right now we're averaging 50 library cards per month. 
Sonny, I just want to, first of all, comment. I mean, it's an excellent presentation, um, extremely thorough. Um, and I know you <laughs> set the standard last year <laughs> with a lot of detail and information. And, and I think you did a great job presenting this. Um, I do want to remind the board is I know we focus a lot on budget increases, but remember that last year there was uh, significant reductions taken to their budget request um, to accommodate for COVID, knowing that there was a very uncertain future about when the, the library wasn't even open last year um, when they came in with their budget request. And, um, and then obviously, you know, we all agreed it made sense to be conservative with the budget because we knew that the library probably was not going to be open for would, would open in July and we just didn't know, we couldn't forecast. So, um, so I think you got to keep that in mind when you start looking at, you know, increases that um, really, um, you know, they haven't had a right sized budget yet for this new building. Um, and so I think what you presented from what I understand is you're hoping that, you know, July 1, you're going to be, you know, 80% where you would hope to be a year ago. Um, and then eventually ramp up to those hours that um, we offer the community five years ago, right? Correct. So Correct. Um, so that's kind of uh, what's reflected here in terms of the request. So with that, I don't know if anybody else from your board would want to weigh in and then we can open it up for questions. Anybody else? No? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to, um, you know, I just want to reiterate um, Sunny's uh, point earlier that the library has not received an increase in its allocation since fiscal year uh, 2013. Um, we really are just asking for an inflationary increase from that time. Um, additionally, when we cannot provide full library services, it does, um, inhibit our ability to fundraise because our donors, you know, aren't going to give the library money if it's not open. And out of respect for, you know, the, the $4 million that we raised from capital donors, you know, they've invested a lot of money and, you know, they've intimated to us that they will continue to invest in the operations. But if we are not open, you know, we just don't feel right going back to them and saying, can you help, you know, fund a particular program, but it's not going to be there. So, and also um, the building committee worked very hard. You know, they've been meeting twice a month for the last four years to see the success of this project and for it not to meet its full potential, you know, I think would be disappointing for a group that is very dedicated. So again, we're just, asking for really for an inflationary increase. Um, the building size is doubled, um, but we're really not asking for much more. Um, Sunny and her team has done an exceptional job keeping expenses in check. Um, as great librarians do, they research every possible expense to the fullest. So that's all for me. I just hope that you will all consider, um, you know, funding the library where it should be. We have a great, great library now and we want to keep it in pace with other libraries around the state so please please consider that uh, when you're making your decisions this year thank you i think peggy as i'm thinking about this and i'm you know in full disclosure i'm the library liaison but um you know the, obviously the 2013 you know no increase since 2013 strikes me and then I recall, was it last year or two years ago when the library had to take that significant cut of 300,000? I recall conversations about, you know, slowly making them whole again to the, the full operating budget. Um, and I believe that was discussed on both uh, the Board of Selectmen and the Board of Finance. But um, I, I think about, you know, we've got this crown jewel in our town um, that, you know, ultimately we want to optimize and leverage and wave the banner and have other people come to our town. I, I worry if there are potential looming cuts that, you know, that is gonna diminish the services, one. And two, it's gonna have, as we have seen, <laughs> people will tend to go to other libraries. They will go to Clinton, they will go to Guilford, God forbid, right? So, you know, at the end of the day, I think we've got to protect our asset here and um, really help, you know, our, residents and patrons 
see the full value um, and the full customer service that um, Sunny and her magical team of librarians do on a daily basis um, and, and use that as a way to, to drive more business, not less business, I guess. So my two cents. Thank you. Thank you. Scott. Time for my two cents, I hope. Um, <laughs> if there was ever a time when the residents of uh, this town um, needed the connections that a library can provide, it's this moment in time. I think of the connections of the uh, social connections, the community connections, the intellectual connect connections and all the programming that the library provides. Um, look, the residents in the past have voted with their feet by using the library heavily. And the residents also voted at referendum that they wanted more library. And so um, maybe I'm a little out of step here, but if we were to make any changes to the budget that's being proposed, I would want to uh, try to increase the number of hours that the library could be open. And so um, um, I see no diminishment in this proposed budget, but I'm very curious as to what it would take to be able to keep the library open even more hours beginning July 1st. That's a fantastic question. I would love to answer that. I will pull up some numbers and send them to you on Monday. <laughs> Yeah, I wanted to jump in here if I, I'm not exactly sure I agree with Al on the, on the more hours, but um, there's a couple of thoughts here. One is there was a lot of money raised privately, and, and this is a beautiful library. Not to utilize it, I think, would be a mistake. Two, I know you mentioned, Sonny, the 160000 for pension uh, obligations, for lack of better terms, which is, really has nothing to do or fault of your own. And, and I, I think the fact that people are living longer, a good thing, I, you know. Uh, <laughs> And Fillmore, that goes for you too, even though you're drawing on the pension. <laughs> but I also think the actuarial one is living long. The other part of that is investment rate. If you tweak the investment rate a half percent either way, you either don't have to contribute as much money or you have to contribute more. So we can have that discussion. So uh, my point to this is that, that 136000 is no fault of yours or, or anything that you've done or anything like that. So you know, uh, a lot of the costs are fixed. I know they're staffing, but not to have this library uh, utilized to almost capacity um, right. it, it would be a shame. And I do agree with Al this time. I think it's a, it's a, it's a really need. So I just wanted to mm -hmm. chime in there with those couple of points. Yeah, I, I, just real quickly to highlight the pension again, because that kind of does get lost in it. That's a big number. The town took that hit last year in its budget. So um, we knew this was probably going to come we were able to do it last year, but it's gonna to have to be done. That's of nothing that they have a control and that's uh, almost half of the increase um, that you're requesting. So a uh, good point, John. Yeah. Thanks. I just hey. wanna add my two cents into what Al said as well. Um, but the, the town did vote for a big expend, expense item here in the library and it reflected the town's desire to have um, a state of the art library facility for all demographics of the town. Um, I also would like to actually see, it, it distresses me to hear um, you talking about cutting the library hours. In my 25 years here, I've been um, a, a mom of a, of a of uh, a, a kid who went from, you know, he's 21, 22 years old as of next week, mm -hmm. watching him use Guilford's library mostly um, at the different stages of his life, um, being a, a, a mom with a toddler using it, being a remote worker before that was uh, as prevalent as it is now. I have used the library at all different times of the morning, afternoon, evening, and weekends, there's nothing more frustrating than to pack up all your stuff and head down to the library and see it closed. <laughs> um, don't think that's what the people were voting for when they said, we wanted a, a state-of-the-art facility. We don't want to have to go to other towns. Um, 
And I would also support what we can do to make sure that we have this beautiful new building as showcased as possible, not only for our own residents, but to draw other people to town the way we've been drawn to their towns when our library facilities didn't provide what we needed. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Jude. Totally agree. Stacy, is the pension contribution going to be an annual change or is that a one-time uh, correction to the funding? You know, I actually don't know. I know it was a one-time hit for the town because of the mortality tables. I'm not exactly sure what their um, position is. I don't know if Sonny okay. knows or not, or if that's Rick. Rick would be the, the number one expert here, um, but I believe there is some ongoing costs. Um, there there be. will be a slight increase annually, um, but also, also to address um, John's questions, I know Stacy, you had also asked us the library to investigate um, the interest rate and I believe the amortization rate because you were able to change some of those things with the town and we cannot do that. So we are at a fixed 5.5% um, on the pension and um, this is where we, we could use Rick's um, inclusion here, but yeah, we've investigated um, reducing this contribution uh, this year and we, are, we cannot do that due to the nature of our pension. Yeah, but, yeah. Uh, the municipality has more flexibility. The library follows ERISA guidelines and yes. the IRS is pretty strict on right. what they can do with the plan. Thank you. So then maybe as a, as a follow-up, uh, hey guys, it would Rick, be good Rick to is know. One of the, uh, what, Rick, Rick's on the side here in the, as one of the attendees. Can we bring him over and he can help? Oh yeah, if you can unmute him, he's the expert. Yeah. yeah, he'll be able to, but I think Stacy explained that perfectly, well, just yeah. the restrictions, yeah. It also depends how often you have your, your actuarial done, some are every two years, some are five years, it depends, and I'm assuming it was Milliman that did it, but I, I'm not sure. The, this is it Rick. Is, can, it is. Can everybody hear me now, or? Yes, yeah. hi, oh, Rick. Awesome. Hi. Um, the answer to your question, John, yes, Milliman is the our actuary who does this. Uh, our plan, uh, unlike the town, is an ERISA plan, and therefore the rates that are uh, used are dictated by the IRS. They are subject to change every year, uh, but as uh, Nicole indicated before, the rates that we use for for this particular year are are given to us. We really don't have any have any flexibility in that regard. Um, the there was another question, and I forgot what it was. That's so uh, it's if, whether if or not I, the pension if, if will increase annually. Oh, yes, the, right. the pension will increase annually. However, this is a year of the big increase. So yeah. it'll increase uh, substantially less in the, the next two to three years. We did have uh, uh, Milliman run a scenario for us, the most likely scenario over the next three years uh, for what our pension contributions would be. And we can uh, dig that out and certainly share it. So I, I think for follow-up, that would be good to know what the one-year correction is and then what the right operational expense moving forward would be. Okay. Um, but I think, uh, let me jump in on that. I think that uh, one of the key elements here is uh, just like the town, uh, and correct me if I am incorrect here, but the uh, library is not adding people to their um, defined benefit pension. Is that correct? That, that's correct. Yeah. It was frozen in 2014. Right. So, the, so there are no new people going on this list. This is basically uh, wow. yeah. just the contribution to keep the fund available to pay out what has already um, um, been contracted for. Yes, that's correct. For a, uh, a fixed number of people and a last an occasional decline. Yes. Correct. That's great. Well, I guess a question for Rick. Uh, so the, this year, the major change is because of the actuarial tables, which I would imagine those probably don't change every year, or maybe not even that frequently. But would there be there probably would there be an annual adjustment? Just uh, how often do you have to adjust for investment return expectations? I would think that might be annually. annually. It is. It's annually. Okay. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. Annually in July. Yes, but the but the mortality tables, I guess that's just kind of whenever you know ad hoc, whenever they feel a, a change is 
is, that, is, is necessary. Is that right? That's correct. Yes. Yeah, and they actually just historically, so you know, there used to not be a separate mortality table for municipal employees. And then they came out with this. Um, mm -hmm. And it was, very, it was different. They live longer than kind of what <laughs> the rest of the world, uh, I guess, does. So they get treated um, so well. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, um, but this was, you know, we're so, you know, we, we, we took that pain last year. A lot of communities had to start uh, reflecting a specific table for mm -hmm. municipal employees. And my only point to all I think the I think yeah I think the answer is we need to start drinking more soda and eating processed food. Yeah. But I um I, I had a I had a question on the revenue side, Sonny or Nicole. Yes. Uh, and I think we talked we talked we talked about it last year, but I just remind us um you know because it is a beautiful facility from the outside and from the inside and and in terms of room rental, which might be more like evening or any time, but um, there's not a lot of revenue. So remind us kind of what the program is for that. And and I, I don't recall if there's kind of limitations on how much you can charge because of either, either either library kind of regs or maybe town regs. But can you just remind us of that program? Yeah, absolutely. So in preparation for going into our new building, the board uh, approved several policies, including one that um, a, uh, provides guidance for what happens in our meeting rooms and uh, they will be free to use for nonprofit groups and community groups and there will be a small charge uh, in order to defray costs for private individual use or business use so if, if a company wanted to hold a staff training in one of our rooms there would be a small cost um, at the time we um, discussed with Peggy um, getting together with other uh, other room use facilities around town to make sure that we were sort of on the same page as far as what those fees would be. Um, obviously, that got put on hold. And um, with this, with our hours, with our hours being um, up in the air right now, it's hard to quantify, you know, open hours will determine how much use those rooms can get, which will determine how much revenue we can expect from them. Um, originally, we had had um, in our estimate for last year about $2,000 of revenue for those rooms. Um, we expect that it would uh, go up from there as you know, hours and use increase. Uh, but we don't know, given the pandemic, we don't know how how soon people will feel comfortable using rooms and how many hours will they'll be available to the public. So we've, we've sort of put it on hold, but yes, I do expect that before the end of the next fiscal year, we will be able to restart that uh, program. It's just hard to quantify when and, and how much revenue it will be. Sunny, um, the the benchmarking slide that you had, that wasn't in our packet. Um, and, and that's great information. I was wondering if you could make a point of sending that on yeah. to us. The comparison um, and, chart, and, absolutely. Mm -hmm. and, and, I, and I do have a couple of questions about it. Um, sure, let me see. If we could go back to it. I don't remember how to do that. There we go. Yep. I know it's a lot of information. <laughs> it is, I'm just trying to um, understand it. So um, I'm looking at the per capita column and it yes. looks like your your requested budget is for $83 on a per capita basis. So that's just residents in the town, right? Correct. Um, so is is there something to be gleaned from comparing that to Guilford because we are so so close um, the, the, the numbers the funding sure. numbers are 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 similar the, that you've got in your um, municipal appropriation um, but yep. the per capita numbers are way different yes and there is an explanation for that so if you notice on the bottom I put a little disclaimer so Guilford the reason it, it, Guilford's it, not 
The real use in Guildford is not technically a pure library for us is because their population and wealth ranking are different and they have a very different setup. So their salaries for their employees are part of the library budget, but all of their benefits come directly from the town. So their benefits wow. are not included in the information that they provide to the Connecticut State Library, which in turn is provided to the public um, in this format. So for the municipal appropriation, um, I got an approximate figure from the library director in Guilford and added that, um, but I did not have the information I needed to provide an estimate for the municipal appropriation per capita uh, because I don't have Guilford's revenue numbers. So the municipal appropriation is an adjusted figure and the municipal appropriation per capita is not. And that's why that number is lower um, because it doesn't, it doesn't include the cost of benefits. Does that make sense? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Thank it you. Does, it does. It's um, not and, an and again, this is, all really, this is all really first, uh, first pass at this, but then skipping across over to the programming, it looks like Guilford is offering 3,800 programs to our 500, I, uh, is, is yes. there? Yes, there's a reason there? for that as well. So if you notice, even uh, even the most well-funded libraries top out at 11, uh, 1,100, um, the reason that Guilford's are so much higher um, and I is because they count every reference transaction that is over a certain number of minutes, they count it as a program. So if someone comes to the public desk and asks a question about how to use a database or how to find a book, and that goes over say a five minute mark, um, they count that as a program. Other libraries count that as a uh, reference question, which is a different question on the um, statistics we provide the state. So they're counting their programming different from all the other libraries and that's why the number is so different. Um, I've seen I've seen their their list of all their programs for the year, and so I know that's um, that's exactly where that comes from. <laughs> what I'm hearing is they're fluffing their numbers. They are they are putting the numbers in a different category than other well, libraries. Better. So, so. We've, always, we've yeah. always known that Guilford was a little sneaky. <laughs> <laughs> Even better. So. <laughs> um, and, and then. Uh, Jumping, jumping back to the wages and salaries line, I'm down at the bottom looking at the 1718 versus 2021, and it looks like we added uh, a, a roughly a person um, in uh, FTEs, but we increased our um, employee expenses by um, close to 150. Mm -hmm. So did, did, is, is, I'm just trying to understand what, what's driving a, a one person increase at 150,000. Well, it's 1.7 people, but okay. 1.7 people. <laughs> in, in the past five years, I'm guessing that it's uh, inflation costs. Um, our cost for health benefits has gone up quite a bit. If you look at um, it, so not the pension costs, but the cost for medical health insurance. Um, those have gone up precipitously in the past five years. And then the minimum wage has also gone up. And so we are projecting, we have to project for the, um, the increases in, in the minimum wage as well, which affects a lot of our part-timers. And that 1.7 FTE includes, um, you know, several part-time positions at that rate. Excuse me, 1.8, excuse me. 1.8, thanks. <laughs> Okay, uh, so if uh, if we could, I would love to jump over to the um, the financial the spreadsheet that you provided as part of our package. It's I'm looking at page two fifty two in our book. Um, it um, starts with an actual nineteen twenty and then a proposed twenty twenty one and a draft twenty one twenty two. Yep. One of Greg's um, and, and I'm down at the. Pardon. One of Rick's famous spreadsheets. Yeah, so um, I'm down at the total physical plant number, and I'm and I'm noticing that the draft budget is actually a decrease in the physical plant operating expense. Yes. Um, and I would be curious to know you've done you've provided a lot of historical data. I was wondering, since um, the 1920 is such an aberration in the experience of the library, if yeah. we have prior years um, expenses that could be made available to us. 
um, in, in the historic context. So we can see where that's trending. But um, I guess my the, the obvious question is, is you've moved into the bigger building um, and you are proposing a decrease in your your the expenses to run your physical space. Yes. So if you look uh, if you look at the little line items, um, that small decrease is made up of even tinier decreases. So as we have been in the building for, for six months, we have updated this continuously. So it's small things like geothermal, um, we're now is down about 400, just the estimate. Last year, it was based on estimates provided by our vendors. And we have found in actuality that is just slightly less. Um, our trash removal is down uh, just slightly, a little over $1,000. So it's really just uh, small things like that um, that we have learned just from being, actually being in this building for six months. So we've, we have actual numbers to base that on now. And thankfully, they are slightly down. So, uh, well, and some of that the, also could have been based on decisions made too, right? And going with geothermal and things to, to generate more efficiencies in a newer building. Yeah. yeah, we have been as thrifty as possible. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah, no, and certainly that was part of the rationale for for the town to exactly. um, endorse spending the extra money on the new building was that we would hope to see some offsets to operating a larger space. Um, right. That um, I don't think we ever were um, expecting that it would be less expensive to run that building than the old building. If it is, then, hey, that's, that's fabulous. <laughs> Hallelujah. Um, well, I think um, though, so, the, one, one other thing to note is just that the mechanicals of the building, you know, have been phenomenal in terms of, you know, I think the, I, I remember some of the numbers we talked about, there's been an increase in utilities and things like that, but it's at a fraction uh, relative to the square footage size of the building. So we've really gotten a much more highly efficient space for a, a very small incremental growth in the uh, utility part of the budget. So that's something to highlight, I think, which is a fantastic job that the building committee has done on this. Definitely. And then I'm sure you guys all saw in my, um, in my notes that came with your packet, um, we are also benefiting because of the uh, electricity that we are generating that is going back into the grid. And uh, we are anticipating 12,000 in income from the Clean Air Fund next year. Um, that oh, is something we will benefit from um, for the next 15 years. And this year that's helping offset a slight um, decrease in income from the friends who haven't been able to hold book club uh, book sales for us. So that's really helpful. Um, it will fluctuate a bit based on how much sunlight we have, um, but it's something we can look forward to for the next several years. Uh, so, yeah, and so I guess what I'm trying to put together, I'm trying to link in my head is, is the, um, the building itself doesn't seem to be driving the ask for extra operating funds. Um, the, um, so the increase in space um, you know, the doubling in space, um, linking that with the, 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 the budget. It, it, unless I'm misunderstanding the numbers, doesn't seem to be driving it. And if we pull the, um, the, the correction to the pension out of it, um, what, what really is the, the increase that the library is asking for? It's the need for increased staffing due to square footage. So um, the uh, Connecticut State Library puts out a uh, recommended numbers, recommended guidelines for how many staff building, uh, how many staff members you should have in a building at one time based on square footage um, for the safety and security of your staff patrons and then also to protect your investment. So um, compared to our previous building, um, we have twice as much space that we need to not only provide, provide services for, um, but also um, monitor. So we have more public service desks where people can come to get information and we have a second floor now. So, you know, if we tried to run the library with the same number of staff members, there would be huge portions of the building um, without any staff presence whatsoever. And our second floor, um, which is new and has a new public service desk that has to be staffed whenever we're open, um, 
that space includes our teen area. So we, we definitely cannot leave um, that space unattended when we're open. Thanks for that. I think so. Yeah. I think we have a disconnect because the the information we were given, the proposed staffing for this upcoming year is exactly the same as last year. There is no increase in in staffing in, or in hours um, in our budget book. So, so I think that the that's because that includes staff members that um, I am going to request a special appropriation for. Let me find that piece of paper. Yes, so in the current year, you'll see there are four positions listed with a note that say hire in April, 2021. Those are included in my request for a special appropriation that will be coming forward mid-February. Um, this year, uh, we were able to retain all of our current staff members because we received PPP funding. Uh, so we did not have to suffer layoffs this year. If we had not received PPP funding, um, we would have had to do that because the current allocation um, from the town does not uh, support even our current staff. Um, much less the, the addition of these four. Uh, we have looked into uh, our ability to apply for a second round of PPP funding and determined that we are not eligible. So we cannot count on receiving any PPP funds in the future. Sorry. Can you speak a little bit more to that? I'm surprised that, that you're, you're not eligible. Yes, it's because they have added a, an additional eligibility requirement um, that anyone applying for a second time must prove a 25% decrease in revenue um, year to year. And we did not receive a, a decrease in revenue last year. I got it. Yeah, and Sorry. we did we did verify that with our a representative from the Guilford Savings Bank. Sonny, this is Rick. I, I just want to, and perhaps, you know, I joined late and I missed it. Um, part of the salary versus physical plant issue in the budget reflects that you're hiring custodians, correct? Correct. So we're actually removing money that would otherwise be in the physical plant number for cleaning out of the physical plant number into the salary line. And that salary line reflects the two part-time custodians that are hired, which also feathers into the 1.8 FTE increase. I'm not sure. If Thank you. Yes, you know, that was a big part of my presentation last year. Um, and I didn't highlight that this year. So thank you for bringing that up. Uh, yes, we're able to remove uh, quite a bit of our cleaning costs from our physical plant um, expenditures and sort of get a two for one with the custodians where they're providing cleaning services uh, throughout the day, which is very critical right now. And then they're also adding an additional staff member in the building so that we can meet those uh, recommended numbers for our square footage. So we're getting a two for one there. Yeah, Sonny, I thought if I recall last year, I thought that was one full-time person. Is that, am I recalling correctly? Or and now it's two part-time people? So the plan, the plan has always been to have two part-time people, um, partially to keep the cost down. And I think the, the lack of not having that, uh, those employees right now has really been one of the main drivers of why they've had such limited hours open, whereas other libraries and other communities, they already had the staff. Um, Guilford had, has always had custodial staff. So they're able, they were able to be open a lot more during the pandemic to meet all the requirements from the state. So that's really restricted why we've had kind of these like very limited blocks of time when they could be open to the public. Okay, so I'm, I'm sorry. I, 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 I guess that maybe I was misinformed. I thought that the, the limited hours at the library was driven more by the pandemic and state guidance and, and um, that's not true. Uh, no, they're both correct. So the guidance from the uh, state re uh, requires cleaning throughout the day um, in order to have things available. So without custodians to do that, um, what, for one, several things just couldn't be made available. And two, in order to just uh, provide the bare minimum, we needed to close so that our regular library staff 
um, could go around and disinfect counters and frequently and frequently touched surfaces and then reopen um, since they couldn't be at the public desk to serve patrons while they were performing those those cleaning tasks. There was a major added expense with COVID with cleaning and, and supplies and everything else major. Yeah. yeah, I think you were telling me you don't you quarantine books and things coming in to be the whole there's a whole process. A yes, process. all items are quarantined for four days on the way in before wow. uh, staff uh, touch them or wow. put them out for patrons. So the cleaning of the doorknobs and the cleaning of this and everything, it's, it's major. So, so, yeah, okay, so I, I mean, I'm still, I'm, I'm, I'm still a little confused. I, I, so let me put this another way. If we were to provide the custodial services tomorrow, you would be open normal hours as, as, as if nothing were going on or? Very uh, much, much closer to that. So in Guilford, um, they have a full time as well as part time custodial staff and they've been able to be open about six hours a day. They do still have some closures uh, just so the custodians can uh, clean their bathrooms um, without having patrons in there at the same time, etc. We were open four hours a day. Yes, with custodial staff, we could be much closer to normal and we could probably um, extend our hours quite a bit. And, and that's what that special appropriation that they want to come forward so they can just staff up and be open because I know my kids have been going to Clinton and to Guilford because the hours, even when you were open for those limited hours, it was just tough. It, you had to catch it for those two hour yeah. blocks. So, um, yeah. And those are public access hours when people can come into the building. The library is open um, eight hours per day. Um, for other services, the takeout services. So the librarians and staff are in there yeah. working, but those are the public service hours. I also about, just want to- Oh, sorry. Um, about, uh, as of last week, about 25% of Connecticut libraries have walk-in hours right now. Um, the rest are open by appointment the way that we are currently or only for computer usage or only for curbside. Of the 25% that provide walk-in services right now, um, I, I believe it's because they, are, they have a better custodial staff and uh, better resources. Well, we're hopeful that you know by July 1, um, yeah. we'll be further along in vaccinating the public and you know, we're not gonna have a lot of these restrictions that um, the library has been operating under. So, um, yeah. Well, I, you guys have provided a tremendous amount of information today. And, and I know Bruce, if you can certainly, we could arrange a, a, an offline conversation if you have some more details you want to dive into, would that be okay? Just to- Yeah, and I'm sorry, I kind of took yeah. everybody on a tangent here. I just, um, I'm, <laughs> oh, I'm, just, I I'm just surprised. Um, uh, I, I really do appreciate all of this extra data and it's, it's a lot to, um, to take in. I think we're going to need time to digest it. But yes, Peggy, I, I I, I'm a little distressed to hear that we have um, not allowed the library to open because we haven't um, been um, working to get them the staff, and we should be meeting to talk about how we um, agreed how agreed. we how we uh, do that. I thought that it was uh, simply a um, uh, a COVID related um, you know mandate. Um, so, so yeah, let's, let's, let's stick a pin in that thought and, and come back around to it as a board of selectmen. Yeah. I want to thank Sonny Sounds and Nicole great. and Rick. You did an excellent job. Thank you. I also, I'll put a plug in here, but I'm pretty sure you have some fundraisers coming up. I know you don't want to mention them here, but maybe you should. <laughs> oh, I'll, I'll mention them, John. You know me. I'm all about fundraising. There you go, Nicole. <laughs> I, I do want to quickly. Fastball right down that. the middle. If I can touch on that just quick, quick, I do want to let all of you know that we have finished the capital fundraising. So we have met our $6 million um, obligation. Yeah. So oh, congratulations. You. I know you've yeah. helped us to promote that. Thank you to all of our, our capital donors out there. Um, so now we can turn our full focus um, to our operating fundraising. And um, as John mentioned, we have a raffle coming up. The drawing will be on February the 14th. It is a year in the heart of Madison raffle. Um, tickets are $20. The prizes include gift cards to a number of businesses in town. 
Um, so it not only supports your library, but it, it supports your local businesses too. So Love we that. have volunteers downtown right now in this cold, cold morning <laughs> selling tickets. Um, you know, you can always contact me or, or the library to buy those, but your help in uh, promoting that for us. Um, and I know a number of you already bought tickets um, would be super and very grateful. So thank you. <laughs> okay, um, great. Yep. Peggy, uh, um, if I could jump in for a second, um, uh, let me segue a little bit uh, off of that and take us up to the uh, uh, 20,000 foot level. Um, the, uh, the request from the library for uh, 1.5 million is in line with the 85% rule um, or understanding, it's not necessarily a rule, but the 85% understanding that uh, between the town and the library so that's in keeping. Then I have I have a, a question. I'm sorry to prolong this, but I have a question. Um, in the budget line, there's a capital request for the mortgage payment of fifty six thousand um, dollars. This might be a Stacy question. I don't know. It, is that the uh, uh, the property that the that, that the town contributed to when we bought that house, sort of in the backside here, fifteen years ago or something? The Myler Range property. Yes. Yeah. So that um, uh, that should be running out. Uh, was that a twenty-year mortgage or a twenty? It has five more years to go. Yeah, I know we have five, five more years to go. Um, and the good news is that we were able to um, refinance it this year with a more favorable rate. Um, so we are saving about four hundred dollars a month, I believe it is. That's seven hundred dollars um, a month, approximately. Yeah, okay. okay, even better than I remembered. Um, and then it will run out in five years. Okay. That up. Good. Thank you. I just want, I just want to ask Fillmore a question. How is that twenty thousand feet? Scott, <laughs> <laughs> uh, get started, please. You dove well, right back in, my man. So, so uh, r rather than looking at. Uh, 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 how many hours the janitors are, are doing? I figure that's the, that's the five foot level. <laughs> there you go. There me. you go. All right. I'm I'm, I'm up uh, at twenty thousand foot level, <laughs> looking at a at a at a big picture. That's the twenty thousand foot financial level there. Scott. Yeah. There you go. There you go. <laughs> so I just well, want to say thank you to everybody. Thank you, John. Thanks, everyone. Yeah. Okay. Good to see well, you all. Thank yeah, thank you so much. I think we're um, we're done. So um, and uh, and true to our schedule, an hour ahead of time. So <laughs> thank you all, all right. so much too. It's thank you all for your thank time. You. Okay, thank great. You. Thanks. Yeah. And then uh, we will, um, you know, from here, our board will take it to the next level. And I wouldn't mind if you just send around this actual presentation, Sonny. That yeah, would be we'll great. We'll do. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you guys. All right. Thanks have a good so Saturday. Thank you very much. Bye, -bye. Thank you. Bye. Uh -huh.